kid said to me, I, I got to make it outrageous. What was uh, his diagnosis for women when they came to the office? You have the three F disease, right? You're fat, female, and over 40. He was, as his kids described him, the, a doctor of profanity, the master of swearing. And don't cut him off on the highway, for he had more than a, choo- a few choice words for you. He certainly used a colorful vocabulary. But we all put up with this. For firstly, he was a fabulous really, diagnostician. He knew his stuff and relished studying medicine. As somebody mentioned to me on the way in, when I was your doctor, you didn't need a patient advocate. He was your patient advocate. You know, he would come in and yell at the nurses for not taking care of you. It's the only doctor I knew that went back and took his boards all over again just to prove it to his children and to himself that he could still do it and keep up with his medical knowledge. He was very bright, you have to admit that, except when it came to a cordless phone that got wet outside and he put it in the microwave to dry it. (laughs) Secondly, when you, you came to the office, he and his nurse partner in crime, Irene McCarthy, made you feel as if you were the only patient that he had that day. He took time with you. He wrote his notes in the most incredible, precise printing that you can ever imagine. I don't know how he could write that small. His medical records were beyond compare. And, of course, he had very colorful ways of asking you things like your urine stream. Told me that when I was younger, I could knock a fly off of a wall. Now, now if... Now the fly takes out a soap dish and a brush. And <laughs> <laughs> but one thing you know, that any signal of distress never got by him without do his doing additional testing. He knew who was the best doctor in each of the fields so as that you would get the best care. And he would call you, call you to find out how you were. McCarthy, get me, uh, he would scream in the office. Well, he was colorful, you have to admit. Of course, some of his color came from the shorts he used to wear at home. (laughs) With his spindly legs and and no shirt on. Weighed down by the hundreds of (laughs) charms that he wore around his neck that patients had given him. I asked him, how did he ever stand up with all that gold around his neck? He would rub his extended stomach and then call me a fat bastard. (laughs) As his family said, he was the most comfortable person they knew with his own body. Of course, he would then comment, pointing to a certain organ and saying, out of this small thing came you four bastards. (laughs) Don't forget it. (laughs) And how could they? For he told you that all the time. I guess you kids grew up and turned into such terrific people, and and Dad was very, very proud of you, in spite of your dad. (laughs) Of course, you had to develop that sense of humor, and you did, to to counter his sense of humor. You knew that he loved you, and he was concerned about you. He always had kisses for you, and whenever you left, what would he say? Don't forget to call when you get home. He reveled in your achievements and how proud he was. And you put up with all of your dad's idiosyncrasies. He thought of himself as a collector, a collector of masks. Did you ever see the masks that he has down the basement? Some of you? Everywhere. Russian plates, state quarters, charms. And you, you thought of him as a hoarder, a pack rat with OCD. He would listen to all of the Indians in the Ohio State games on a much too loud television or radio. And he envisioned himself as Dick Martin on Laugh-In. And you thought of him that he was Laugh-In. You put up with his attachments to his home. He, he never really traveled, although you have wonderful memories of the family trip out west. I, uh, you knew how he was just satisfied being at home with, with Ruthie, the girl that he met on the porch of a dorm at OSU and set out to marry her. And he did won you over. And then you spent uh, two years in the Air Force, um, 
the flag on his coffin in Arizona after his internship. And from then on, it was, Ruthie, can you make me this? And Ruthie, how do you get the, how do you do this? And Ruthie, uh, I need, I couldn't function without you, Ruthie. And he knew that. And how worried he was about you when you, you underwent your recent illness. I mean, that's all he could talk about is, Ruthie, you're going to really have to give us all lessons of, of how you managed to keep him appeased for 50 years. You were a fantastic wife to him. And he was a good husband and provider for you with an enormous sense of pride for you and for the children. He adored uh, these grandchildren, Jason and Kevin and Adam and Benjamin and Dean and Cameron, and of course, the only girl, Jessica. How proud he was of you and how much he loved you. And you will have high, high stories to tell and keep his memory alive for the, the rest of your life. And Jeffrey and Lori and Greg and Pamela and Laura and Blaine and Robert and Diana, all your friends adored him. They, uh, too, learned like you to come in and give him a kiss. And, and you, Lori, Pam, Blaine, and Diana thought of, of High as, as another parent for you. 